Hey everybody, welcome to Pathfinder Church where we're bringing together imperfect people in pursuit of a whole life. I'm Melissa Harding and I'm on the Life Journey team here at Pathfinder. Um, wherever you are on your life journey, wherever you are physically or whatever stage of life you find yourself in, I hope that today you feel that you belong here and I want you to know that we're so happy to have you joining us. Um, if you're joining us live, don't forget to pick up your phone, jump in the chat, text in, say hi, tell us where you're watching from. We, we want to hear from you. Um, also, we don't want you to miss out on any new content, so make sure you hit the subscribe button, ring the bell so that you get notified if we post a new video. Um, also, the last thing you can do today is share this experience with somebody, whether or not you text it to a friend or a family member or share it on social media. You never know, you never know what kind of impact it could have on somebody that you share it with, so don't forget to do that today. Um, we're going to kick off our service with some singing, uh, so help me in welcoming Jonathan and Rona as we begin week two of Broken Heroes.
God's been good to you. Put your hands together. Come on, let's go. Well, good morning, church. Again, welcome to Pathfinder. My name is Dion. I'm one of the pastors here. That's right. And my name is John, and I'm a volunteer. In other words, you're not a pastor here. No, I'm not a pastor. You get mistaken for that sometimes. I though. do get asked that a lot. Yes, you anytime should, I'm up here. You should Are you think about one? it. You should think about it. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, we want to welcome you to Pathfinder. We're in a series called Broken Heroes, where we're looking at the the full stories of people that maybe, if you grew up in the church, you heard about, and and we're helping you see the fuller. Part of all of them. We're going to look at a woman named Sarah today. That's right. Come. There's a lot of scripture, but it's a lot of really good content. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about it later. But right now, I just want to extend a warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. If there is anything at all you need during the service, please just feel free to make your way out to the lobby. We have some amazing volunteers out there that can help you out. And if you're joining us online, I, I know that you've already been greeted, but I want to extend another warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Yeah, and wherever you are, we would love to get to know you. So whether you're here in the room or you're online, you can send us a simple text, the word hello to 43506. That'll give you a link where you can tell us more about you and we can find a way to serve you. Or you can text that same number with the word Pathfinder and find out what's going on here at Pathfinder this week. That's right. And if you want to get plugged in even more and learn a little bit more about who we are and who this church is, a great place to find out more information about that is our program called Getting Started. Uh, it's a great way, like I said, just to learn a little bit more. And that is on October 10th at 9 a.m. You can come to that in person or you can join online. Yeah. Now, the reason I still have you standing, I know some of you in the room are like, he forgot. I didn't forget. <laughs> this is how it's supposed to go. We're going to sing again in a minute. Uh, but this weekend is also the weekend of the Great Bible Giveaway. Uh, which is one of my favorite weekends of the entire year. It is year. so exciting. Um, we're going to give away Bibles to three-year-olds and second graders. Three-year-olds and second graders. And we're still in COVID, so this works differently. We have a lot of families who are picking them up outside after. Um, but we are going to have some kids who are going to receive Bibles here in the service today. So if you've got a three-year-old or a second grader, whether you registered or not, we would love to put a Bible in the hands of those kids. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you've got a kid that age, to take one adult, just one adult for the kids. Someone has to stay around and take pictures, right? <laughs> so one adult out into the lobby right now, meet our uh, Pathfinder Kids staff. They're gonna get you set and ready because in a minute we are gonna come back and we're gonna give away some Bibles. So right now, one adult, kids, go out to the lobby. Now do not delay, post haste, go. <laughs> hey. And uh, the rest of us are gonna continue on seeing. We'll be here about 70 minutes today. And God is present, he loves you. He's got great things in store for you. So today we just open up our hearts to the goodness of God. Amen. Let's keep worshiping. Well, good morning. This is Elise and Jonathan, and I'm Rona. And uh, this next song that we're going to sing, you might remember from last week. And the lyrics really speak about God's heart for us, despite our brokenness. And now we invite you to sing these words with us and really take these words into your own heart. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I will sing 
a seat. Here at Pathfinder Church, one of the scriptures that drives us and has driven us for a long time is uh, Psalm 78, where the psalmist writes, we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our Lord, our, our God, his power, the wonders that he has done. So the next generation would know them and the children yet to be born and they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God. It really does drive so much of what we do here from our incredible kids ministry to what we do with students. We really do believe that it is our privilege and our responsibility to tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of, of our God, to tell them about the goodness of God so that they would know not only what God has done, but they would know God Himself, And that's why this weekend's so incredible, where we get to place Bibles in the hands of kids. Uh, Three-year-olds, we got these, these picture Bibles, you know, very limited words. Um, these were treasured possessions in our household, I know, for my kids. And then second graders get their own version of a, of a full NIV Bible. It's got some extra commentary and things for kids, but um, it is the full, real deal as they're able to read. Today, as you watch these kids, who are just a representation, a, a portion of the kids that we reach each and every week, as you watch these kids receive their Bibles, I encourage you to go ahead and say a prayer of blessing over them, not just them, but over the entire next generation. We know that, that the work that we do, the church of God, is only one generation away from extinction at any given time. Only one gap in time is needed for, for all the goodness of God, the stories of God just to kind of fall out of people's minds, fall out of our consciousness, to fall out of the, of the, of the hearts of our people. And so uh, today as you watch these kids receive their Bibles, uh, pray over them, pray over the work that we do as the next generation. And then I want you to also take in this song that we're gonna sing. Uh, you can pray these words or sing these words over the kids, but also claim these words for yourself because God is good and he loves you and he's got something powerful to say over you. Let's do it.
Yeah. So many kids that we ran out of song. That's awesome. That's awesome. So all of you kids who just received your Bible, I want you to kind of stand up. And I want you to hold the Bible up over your heads. Uh, yep, yep, be proud about that. As you're doing that, I want to speak a blessing over you, your Bibles, and your next steps in your journey with God. May God bless you as the Word of God dwells in you and in your homes so richly. May you grow in the knowledge of how much God loves you and the great plans He has for you. And as His Word abides in your houses, May his love abide all the more, his grace and his power. In the name of Jesus, amen. Church, can we celebrate these kids and their new Bibles? Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, what a special moment there that we all got to share with those kids taking another step on their life journey as the next generation. It just gives me so much hope to see that. Well, I don't know if you have noticed recently, but speaking of hope, there seems to not really be a lot of hope towards the future lately these days. And I don't know if it's just that more and more people are resigning to the thought that the world of tomorrow is going to be worse off than the world of today. But here at Pathfinder, we are not content with letting that future just happen to us. No, we are committed to changing that narrative and to creating a different future by mobilizing this next generation of world changers. But that doesn't happen just here this weekend on the Bible giveaway weekend. No, that is happening every single weekend and every single day in between. And here's what's clear to me, is that there are so many kids and students in this next generation that are being guided by God and His Word that that gives me an immense hope for the future. And so I invite you to give towards that hopeful vision of the future by supporting our work with this next generation. And you can do so by going online to pathfinderstl.org give. And if you call Pathfinder your home church and you haven't committed to your next 27 months yet, let me stop right here and listen. We still need you. And there's still time for you to make your commitment. And if you're curious about what that means, you can find out more information on that online on our website. But for now, take this moment to thoughtfully and prayerfully consider giving to support our work here. Thank you. So today I want to talk about fallen heroes. When I say fallen heroes, I'm not referring to those who have fallen on battlefields to protect life, uh, to protect country or freedom for the rest of us. I, I'm not talking even about first responders who give themselves in the line of duty to help keep other people safe. Uh, today as I talk about fallen heroes, I'm thinking about this phenomenon of toppled statues. This is kind of a new phenomenon in our world right now, right? Um, and it's interesting when you think about it because at one point in time, there were, were people who others deemed, right or wrong, others deemed them to be heroic. They made some sort of contribution to the world. And uh, so much so that someone said, you know, we ought to commission a statue of that person. We ought to put it in a public place. We should set it up somewhere. And that happened. And then over time, 
Sometimes it's a change of perspective or a change of values, or sometimes it's just new information that we've received about these people that were commemorated with statues. We've kind of turned and said, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't such a good idea to put up a statue of that guy. And then the statues come tumbling down. I think if there were a, uh, a moniker for what the first couple of decades of the 21st century, there was a name given to them, it, it might be this, the age of the fallen hero. Think about it, whether literally or figuratively, think about all of the people once thought of as heroic who have been knocked off their pedestals. And here's where I bring this up. I want to be clear that this is not what we're trying to do in this series. We are not setting out trying to disparage or tear down people in the Bible that maybe you, if you grew up in the church, once thought were great. And we're, we're not trying to dishonor them. Instead, what we're trying to do through this series is we're trying to show you that the only kind of hero that actually exists is a fallen hero, a broken hero. That God, time and time again, chooses to use fallen or broken people to do his work, and here's why. Because that's the only kind of person God has available, right? The one time when he needed someone better than someone fallen or broken, he sent his son to do the job because no one else would do. See, I hope that instead of letting this series tarnish the reputation, hear me on this, Instead of letting this series tarnish the reputation of so-called Bible heroes, what I hope it does is I hope it allows you to accept the contributions of people who are deeply flawed. Say that again. I hope it allows you to accept the contributions of people who are deeply flawed. Then and now. Because they, just like you, are fallen, broken people. And here's what we know. God loves to use fallen, broken people for very significant things. That's what we're going to see today. Uh, I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the story of a woman, probably the best known woman in the Bible, right after Mary, the mother of Jesus. A woman by the name of Sarah, or Sarai. Um, she is uh, a woman who we kind of got part of her story last week with Doug Moss. She's married to a guy named Abraham. Uh, and I want to show you first what the New Testament says about her, how she's remembered so many years later after her life. This is from Hebrews chapter 11. It says, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. So Sarah's getting a commendation here saying, hey, she, she, she's remembered, she did something heroic, she was able to have a child late in life, we're going to see this child became very significant, and, she, and that happened because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She was, she's to be commended for her faith, and then it goes on and it says, and so from this one man, Abraham, her wife, and uh, her husband, she's his wife, got that straight, uh, and he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. If you were here last week, you know something about that. So today we're going to look at Sarah, who, although she was used by God for something incredible, she really became the mother of God's chosen people. And we're going to see this too, that we are now heirs, she's part of our, or we're part of her line by faith. The reality is, although she's commended for her faith, the reality of Sarah's life is she was kind of a mess just like the rest of us, but in a specific way. Uh, today we're going to look at a bunch of scripture. We're going to start in Genesis 16, and we're going to look at Sarah's penchant for cruelty. Genesis 16 goes like this. Now Sarai, that was kind of her name first. She has a name change, just like Abram or Abraham does. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. This is after a long marriage. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And so Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And so he slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. 
I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now that's, that's kind of like if you're throwing down the gauntlet in the Bible, like I don't know what it looks like in your house, but when you're really mad and you want to let somebody know and you got that thing that you say or you, you, know, you slam the door, you, whatever the thing. I mean, this is the biblical phrase that you know you're really mad. May the Lord judge between you and me. It's like, hold me back. The, the Lord's got to get in between this because if it's up to me, you're in trouble. May the Lord judge. I mean, she's throwing it down. And Abram says this. He says, hey, your slave is in your hands. She's not my slave. She's yours. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai uh, mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Now, we could go back to last week and talk all about the contrast between trusting by faith and human striving and the mess that human striving makes of things. That's going to be the, the tale of this week also. But here's what I also want you to notice. I just want you to acknowledge that this is a bad situation. This is a difficult situation. But I think it actually started with some pretty good intentions. Sarai, she, she can't have kids. And it starts with this, this, this selfless act to say to her husband, you know what, I can't have kids, but why should you live your whole life not having any children? How about this? How about you go and, and you take my servant as a, as a, you know, a, a second wife and, and, and you have a child through her, right? I can't experience this joy, but you can. Let me, let me give this gift to you, Abram. And it works. The plan works. I mean, she's being, Sarai's being, uh, She's being innovative. She's being resourceful, and, and it works. But then what happens? I'll tell you what happens. She sees Hagar walking around with that pregnancy glow. She's never experienced that. She's looking at Abram, who's now whistling tunes and smiling big smiles because he's going to be a daddy and somebody's having his baby. And, and she notices those smiles are in the direction of Hagar, and it's just too much. And then you think about Hagar. Hagar's this, this slave woman. We don't know anything about her, but she has no autonomy, no freedom, no hope, no future. And suddenly her fortunes change because she is, is pregnant with the master, her wealthy master's only child. She will give birth to the heir, which means as the mother of the heir, her future went from being uncertain to being secure. So you can't blame Hagar for, for feeling some relief, maybe feeling confident, maybe feeling overconfident, maybe feeling a little cocky. And then, of course, Abram, I mean, I feel bad for him. I, I have a hunch most women don't. They're like, whatever, Abram. But I feel bad for the guy because here's this guy, and, and you know, he loves his wife. And they've been through this heartache of not having a kid together. They've, they've been through it together. And, and then his wife says, hey, here's this plan. Go ahead. And he goes, oh, it makes sense to me. And, and now he's stuck between the wife that he loves and the woman who will be the mother of his child. And, and they're trying to pit him. And he's just, he, he just want, wants nothing to do with it. And so what happens is Sarai, in, in her power and her privilege and her wealth, she begins, it just gets to the best of her, she begins to mistreat Hagar. And Hagar can't, can't live under this mistreatment. It just This cruelty becomes too much for her. Uh, and so she does the only thing she can do. She runs away, which is basically a suicide mission in those days. A single woman, pregnant woman, no resources, runs off into the wilderness. And Abram's like, ah, y'all just figure it out. I'm going to be over here, you know, waiting to see what happens after all the carnage is over. It's an incredibly human tale. And here's what I notice about all of this, that, um, that, that Sarai, her name actually, Sarai or Sarah, or the name means princess. But here's what you'll start to see, that although she's got this name, princess, you start to see that Sarai is anything but a Disney princess. In fact, throughout most of this narrative, she's going she's gonna to be more like the wicked queen, the wicked stepmother, Right? And so she starts to mistreat Hagar, abuses her, shows all kinds of cruelty to her. Hagar runs away. I think of the Taylor Swift song from way back in the day, Why You Gotta Be So Mean. I mean, Taylor Swift's actually got a few songs about mean people, but I, I hear the song playing in the background because instead of being a, you know, a dignified princess, Sarai, she, she, she lets the, the worst angels of her nature take control. She gets taken over by these wicked stepmother vibes. 
and she starts to abuse this poor slave woman. But I want to show you that in spite of her cruelty, Sarai's cruelty to Hagar, maybe in spite of Hagar's rashness, God remains to be good. So the angel of the Lord found Hagar after she runs away near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai. Now, this seems like an interesting introduction to me because we just sang a song, you know, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. And all this wonderful identity we get from God. And God meets this woman. And, and this is all he can say about her, Hagar, slave of Sarai. That's all you are. You're a slave. Hold on. Uh, where have you come from and where are you going? God is urging her to, to be honest, to confess. She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, no, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel added, here's why. I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Now, here's what I have to say. Um, b- back on that other slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, here's what I have to say about this. In the ancient world, women had children. They did not have descendants. Lineage belonged to men. And yet God is saying something unprecedented to this slave woman. He's not saying, yeah, yeah, your, your, you know, your illegitimate husband's gonna have descendants. He, he says, no, 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 Hagar, yeah, right now you're nothing but a slave to someone else. You are going to have descendants. You're going to have a great nation. They're going to be too numerous to count. In other words, I've got a future for you. So don't be afraid to go back. I'm looking out for you. And then he goes on. Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which basically means like God hears or God has heard. Okay, Ishmael, God hears or God has heard. And you're going to see a lot of word play here about why this is a significant name. So you shall call him God hears for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. He's going to be stubborn, hard to control. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her You are the God who sees me. I love this, by the way, right? So Ishmael's his name. God has heard. God hears. Hagar, this woman who's a slave woman, she doesn't feel very seen or heard in life, yet yet she knows God has heard her. Not only that, God has seen her. You are the God who sees me. No one else does, but you see me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Maybe that's just a word for someone here today. You may feel insignificant, forgotten, And yet God hears you, God sees you. He's the one who sees. That is why the well at that place was later called Be'er Lahai Roy, which means the well of the one who sees. It is still there between Kadesh and Beret. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. What does Ishmael mean? God hears, God has heard, yeah, God hears. Um, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So um, this part comes to an end. After 86 years of life, Abram has a son. Hagar has a promise of a hope and a future. Sarai is out in the cold. So we're going to go to the next part. 13 years later, 13 years have passed. Now when Abram was 99 years old, So he's already had his first son. Now he's 99, 13 years later. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. By the way, this Hebrew phrase here, I am God Almighty, that's El Shaddai. If any of you were raised in the church a while ago, you know that song, right? El Shaddai. If you don't know the song, you're not missing much. The most impossible song to sing ever in church. Not good for congregational singing, but there's a Hebrew phrase, El Shaddai, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your number. So God is appearing to Abram. He's about to change his name to Abraham and he's gonna speak a promise over him. We're gonna jump ahead to verse 15. God also said to Abraham, his name's now been changed. As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. This guy's 99 at the time. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. 
Kings of people will come from her. So again, God shows this uncharacteristic regard for women and their lineage, which is not something the normal ancients really, really value very much. But Abraham, watch this, he, he fell face down and he laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Now, this is so common for us, isn't it? I mean, Abraham's going, do I even want a baby at 100? <laughs> right? I mean, is this the time we're going to be chasing around a toddler? Come on. Babies are for young people. That's not for us. God, I have a better plan. I have a better plan. I've already got a son. By this time, Ishmael's about 13 years old or somewhere around there. I've got a better plan. Just whatever you were going to do through this other child, just... Just do that through Ishmael. Spare the trouble, yourself, us. Just, just do this thing through Ishmael. And we do this all the time in life, right? God, God, yeah, I, I know you're calling me to do something and you say, just, just do this thing that I'm blessing, but God, I would rather you bless what I'm doing. Can you just put your blessing here instead of asking me to follow your plans for my life? God, it would just be so much easier if you would just you know, substitute Ishmael and do whatever you were gonna do through this other kid through Ishmael. It would make everything better. Then God said, okay, but, yes, but, I'll bless Ishmael, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. Now, Isaac, remember what Ishmael means? God hears. Isaac means laughter. Laughter. We're going to see how that plays in. I already did a little bit. Um, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael... Again, God hears, I have heard. I have heard you, and I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. So, so 13 years after Abraham, Abraham uh, has a son, God comes back and goes, I've got more to do. I've got more to do, and I'm going to do it through Sarah. Okay, now a short time later, Genesis 18. Sarah gets kind of pulled in on all of this now. She's still out in the cold. Um, there are three visitors, just context here, there are three visitors who come past Abraham's tent one day. And he doesn't realize initially that these are, these are angels. These are divine visitors. And they're actually on their way to go down and destroy an evil city. But I'm not going to tell you all that because this is already complex enough. But on the way, they stop by and Abraham shows that he's a good host. He shows hosp hospitality for these travelers, gives them food. While they're eating, while he's taking care of them, they're sitting under a tree. They ask him this question. Where is your wife, Sarah? There in the tent, he said. Then after one of them, uh, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now this time, right, the last time was just Abram, Abraham. Now this time, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, we know this, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing, by a lot. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and, and my husband is old, will I now have this pleasure right, of crawling around on my knees with a toddler? Come on. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, we're not sure if this is the angel or Abraham later, who's like, hey, what, what did you just do, right? Uh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. So uh, laughter plays in here. And again, we're, we're going to see that happen, uh, see that unfold in a minute. So, so twice now, get this, twice now, God has said, hey, the promise is not just for Abram, Abraham. Sarah, I've also got something to do through you. Twice now he's made a specific promise. Sarah, you are going to have a son, and that son is going to do something special. God's got a special plan for him. Sarah, you're going to be the mother of this great nation that I am raising up. But frankly, 
I mean, the more that I read through this story and just studying it again this week, and I've taught Genesis a lot, the more I get to know Sarah, the more I wonder honestly, God, why her? Again, although her name is my princess, she acts anything like anything other than a princess. She, she's not a very nice lady. She doesn't seem to be very full of faith. I kind of wonder if that's even why God doesn't spend time talking to her directly. He's passing the messages through Abraham, unlike Mary, the mother of Jesus, who gets visited directly by, by an angel. It's, it's like Sarah, she's hardened, she's bitter, she's sarcastic, she's haughty. Why her? And yet God persists. Genesis 21, this is kind of the final section we're gonna look at in this narrative. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. Why her? Because <laughs> the Lord is gracious. He treats us not as our behavior, our actions deserve. He treats us better than what we deserve. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. And Abraham gave the name Isaac. What does Isaac mean? Laughter. That's right. Good job. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. Now remember this? She laughs in the tent, but now she's holding this child named laughter. And she's saying literally, you know, looking at this baby, God has brought me laughter. I think if there's anything redeeming about Sarah's story, maybe it's this, maybe by this time in her life, she's finally learned to take herself less seriously. Maybe she's learned to laugh at herself a little for all of her doubt, all of her disbelief, all of her hardness of heart. She says, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Who would have said that? I mean, God did like five times, literally. Like, and yet, you know, she, she was resistant to it. And you kind of sense a little bit of haughtiness in her. Now this child grew, Isaac, and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. This, this word's a little hard to understand in Hebrew. Um, either uh, it, children were, were weaned probably more like age four in Hebrew culture. You nurse them for as long as you could. So it's kind of a big deal. It was kind of another rite of passage when you were weaned. So maybe his older brother is, is kind of mocking him because he's, you know, this nursing, just, you know, just recently stopped nursing baby. Maybe it's just he was playing around but, but the point is, Sarah looks over at Hagar, she looks over at Ishmael, Abraham's other son, and, and those wicked stepmother vibes overtake her again. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. See, what's going on with Sarah here? I mean, Abraham is enormously wealthy. It's not like there's a scarcity of resources. And yet she's looking at Hagar and she's looking at that son and she's feeling, she's feeling threatened. She's feeling like someone's gonna usurp her crown. Someone's gonna take her husband away. Someone's gonna take her son's estate away. She says, no way, this, this can't happen. Now, now, to be fair, to be fair, by this time, Ishmael's probably about 18. So best case, Sarah's looking at Abraham going, you know what? Honey, this kid is not going to live in our basement for the rest of his life. <laughs> he needs to get out. Except in the ancient world, you, you live together. You kind of set up a bunch of tents. You just added to your group. And see, see the reality is, is, that, is that Sarah gets captivated by this cruelty again and again and again. And although she's holding this baby in her arms and God has come through for her and done this amazing thing and she's trying to laugh at herself... The cruelty does not leave, not after that long of a life lived practicing cruelty. Not, no, this matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. He loved Ishmael. But God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now, this is an important theological phrase. The New Testament picks up on this. Again, God says, you know what? 
I love both of your sons. I'm going to do good things in both of your sons' lives, but I've chosen Isaac to be the son of promise, and through him, I'm going to reckon or reconcile the world to myself. So Abraham, I don't want you to fret. Now, now on the surface, this can look like maybe God is condoning Sarah's cruelty. Right? And, And I don't want you to think that for a minute, but I think instead what God is doing is what God is doing is, is he is, uh, how should I say this? He is giving in, um, he is allowing the hardness of human hearts to have their way. See, he realizes this is an impossible situation. Sarah's not gonna change. The cruelty is just gonna keep happening. The situation's too difficult, it's too impossible. The characters, they're, they're not willing to play by grace. And, and in the same way that God says, you know, he never wants to see a family break, break up. He hates divorce. He says he permits divorce out of the hardness of heart. Sometimes the hardness of human hearts just mean pain upon pain upon pain, cruelty upon cruelty. And God says, that's never my plan, but okay. In the same way, God is not condoning cruelty. Instead, he's, he's allowing this separation because he knows with these people involved, they're not gonna change. It's never going to get better. But nevertheless, I want you to notice how God does not let the cruelty land. He says, I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. So she went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone and they're in the desert, uh, she, go ahead, she went ahead and left her son. He's, again, he's 18, he's not a baby, uh, 18 under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away. That's going to be important in a minute. For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. But again, God heard the boy, right? Ishmael, God hears. God has heard. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Listen, don't be afraid. How many times have I told you? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes. I love this. And she saw a well of water. Now, we don't know if God put the well there miraculously or whether God just allowed her to see something that was already hidden from her eyes. But how true is this to life? You're in the middle of suffering. The world's been cruel to you. You can only see what's bad, what's wrong. And yet there's goodness present. If God will just open your eyes to it, then maybe you'll see. So she went and she filled the skin with water and she gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy. Right, in spite of Sarah's cruelty, in spite of Abraham's abdication, God was with the boy because he's the father to the fatherless. He's the husband to widows. He was with the boy as he grew up and he lived in the desert and he became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. So Ishmael begins his own journey of building a nation and he becomes a father of great nations, many nations. And then about three millennia later, a guy by the name of Muhammad looks back at Ishmael and and says, oh, that's the true father of promise. And and Ishmael becomes the father of Islam. It's it's a crazy story about, again, human striving and all the, the complications that human striving brings. Here's how I wanna end today. Let's just acknowledge that there is plenty of cruelty in our world today. I mean, you look back at these times and you think, man, that was rough back then. And it was, but, but still today, do, do you know that there's 40 million people living in slavery? Living without a hope, living without a future, living without autonomy, living without any control over their life. But it's not just those bigger kinds of cruelty like slavery or human trafficking or, or horrible abuse. There's all the other kinds of cruelty that we have to deal with on the daily, all right? The bullying, the social media lynch mobs, all of the ridicule about, well, you know, you can't share with anyone your politics or your vaccination status or anything without, without opening yourself up to ridicule. There is the exclusion. And exclusion can, be, can just be painful sometimes. And here's what happens when you're personally encountering the cruelty of the world, 
There are two things I want you to remember as, as the people of God, if that's who you are, based on what we've learned today from these events. The first is this, that when you've been wronged by someone, when you're experiencing the cruelty of another, if your hope or your expectation is that someday God is going to turn the heart of that person so that that person repents, they say they're sorry, they come to you and they make amends, they make restitution, they somehow make a decision to repay the cruelty that they've put on you for kindness. If that's your hope, and if that's the only thing you'll accept, you're crying out for justice, God either smite this person for their cruelty or change their heart and make them be kind to me instead, if that's your hope, then here's what you can learn from, this, from this, uh, these events. You are always going to be disappointed. And you will live the rest of your life in perpetual hurt. Right? If, if you're looking to the person who's wronged you and you expect God to do something in their life to change them and that's the only thing you'll, you'll, you'll accept or receive, then you're, you're condemning yourself to live in chronic hurt, chronic disappointment. See, instead, here's what we learn, instead of looking to the one who has hurt you, looking to the source of your pain or cruelty to make it right, here's what we're told to do, here's what we see today. Instead of looking to them, look to God. See, God does not promise that he will do away with all the cruelty of the world. What he does promise his people is that he will not let the cruelty land. He promises that he will make up for every bit of cruelty that we experience and he will repay. He will repay the cruelty for kindness. Look at Isaiah 61, these, these treasured words that Jesus one day stood up and spoke about himself the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, Jesus later said these words, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, right? To those who have been ostracized, who are shut out. I, I came to do good things for you, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim freedom uh, and release for captives and prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who grieve, to take away your ashes and to give you a crown of beauty instead, to take away your mourning and to give you the oil of joy or gladness, to take away your spirit of despair and, and clothe you with a garment of praise. See, see, what does God promise? God says, you're gonna encounter cruelty in life, but instead of looking to the one who has hurt you and demanding that they repay or they change or they become different, don't look at them. Instead, God says, look to me. But that's hard to do, isn't it? I'll just be honest that in the last year and a half, as, as the cruelty of people in our world has come to a crescendo, it's, it's hard not to let human cruelty cause you to doubt the goodness of God, isn't it? Right? When, when, when cruelty is all you can experience, you start to wonder, God, are you good? And again, it's not his, it's not his problem. But it can be easy to doubt the goodness or the kindness of God when you're experiencing great, great cruelty. I, again, I just kind of had this revelation this week studying this thing that this last year and a half has been hard and, and I know what's happened for me. Not only have I gotten kind of burnt out on how mean people can be, and this is true of all ages, right? You experience the meanness of the world, but it has caused me to wonder, it's caused me to doubt, God, are you still good? And the truth is, he is good, and if you're looking to those who have hurt you, if you're looking for them to somehow make it right, you're looking in the wrong place. God promises that in the midst of human cruelty, he will repay us with kindness. That's the first thing to remember when you're facing the world's cruelty. Stop looking at the one who mistreated you for restitution. Look to God, he will repay. Here's the second thing when you're facing the world's cruelty, see and confess the cruelty inside of you. It's so easy to read these narratives and, and, and to make ourselves aligned with whoever the hero is, right? To be like, yeah, I felt that of Hagar and those mean Sarahs in my life. But the reality is both of those things exist inside of you, kindness and cruelty. Sometimes you're the one who's, who's being mistreated. Sometimes you're the one who's mistreated others. And we need to acknowledge that. There's this old Latin phrase. I went to seminary. I had to learn all kinds of Greek and Hebrew and Latin, but forgot a lot of it. But here's one I remember. Simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et 
peccator. It means we are sinners and saints at the same time. Saints and sinners at the same time. That's why the only kind of heroes that exist are fallen heroes. Because in us, there is kindness and there is cruelty and we have to acknowledge, confess, admit both. And here's why that's important, that even in your cruelty, not when someone's being cruel to you, but even when you're the one who's being the perpetrator of cruelty, here's what we see today, God remains kind to you. And if you ever doubt it, I I just want you to think about that moment, if, if you're aware of the gospels, that moment when Jesus is on the cross. And Jesus came into the world for one reason, to show us the kindness of God. Because from the Garden of, the e- Garden of Eden, we had this belief that God was less than kind. And, and so Jesus came to set the record straight, to show us the kindness of God, to do all the things we just read in Isaiah 61, right? to bind up, to heal, to proclaim release, to do good things. And do you remember what the world did when, when they saw Jesus who came just to show the kindness of God? They doubled down on their cruelty. They put him on a cross. And not only did they put him on a cross, they, they, they just heaped cruelty upon cruelty. They stripped him naked. They mocked him. They insulted him. And then they had the audacity to tempt him. After all the mocking, all the insults, all the cruelty, they tempted him. And they said, if you really are the son of God, then why don't you save yourself? Come down off the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but that would have been a temptation too great for me to resist because Jesus, all he would have had to do is wiggle his pinky finger and he could have brought down a show of force from heaven so powerful, so overwhelming that everyone there would have wet their pants in fear, in terror, in horror, right? And yet if you know how the story goes, In spite of the cruelty, in spite of the mocking, the insulting, in spite of the temptation, Jesus didn't take the bait. In the face of their cruelty, he showed kindness to them and to you. See, here's the reality. God God elevates this, this woman, Sarah, This princess who doesn't act like a princess, a woman who laughs at the promises of God and doubts, a woman who nevertheless becomes not only the mother of a great nation, but who we as people of faith consider her a great mother of of our faith. God elevates her to a great purpose. We're a part of her spiritual line. And we could look at this and we could say the audacity, the scandal, or we could look at this and go, thank you God. That's such great news because it's a reminder that when the world is cruel or when we are cruel, God keeps being kind and his kindness never ends. Let's pray and give thanks for that. God in heaven, thank you for your kindness and all the things that we do to resist your work, your will, your goodness, the ways we run away and hide, the ways we laugh at your promise, the way that we interfere, the way we let our hearts get hard. Lord, all the things that we do to run away from you and your goodness, you keep pursuing us with goodness. You do not let our cruelty change you. Thank you. Thank you also today for the promise that when we are under the cruelty of others, we don't have to look to them Instead, we can look to you and and trust and know that you're going to sort it all out, that you're going to be good to us, that your kindness will prevail. You won't let their cruelty land fully. Thank you for that, God. God, I, I pray that today we would all just come to grips again with our fallenness, our brokenness. And God, that facing our brokenness head on, we'd be overwhelmed again by your kindness by the power of your love, by by your promises made and fulfilled, that none of us would ever feel disqualified, forgotten, forsaken, but Lord, that you would remind us that no matter what, you're kind. Help us keep our eyes focused on you, looking to you, trusting in your goodness in the middle of a world that is often cruel, even when we are part of it. Lord, may we look to you in Jesus. Amen.
as we sing this last song, let's bring our hopes, our fears, our doubts over to him. Because just as Dion said, when we do, we see that God is there and he has been there all along and he is good and he is at work and his plans are good for us. So we can rest and know that it is well. Please stand and sing this with us. Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Close our service again by fixing our eyes on a God who is good. No matter what the world is, he remains to be good. Pray with me this prayer that Jesus taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, Prosper the City is almost here and we are so excited about it. Teams are starting to meet beginning next week for planning. And so if you are leading a team, make sure to get your team registered. Otherwise, if you are not a part of it yet, we want to encourage you and, and everyone to be a part of this. Absolutely. So find some friends, find some family, find some neighbors, get a team together and get registered. Otherwise, we can get you placed on a team as well. Uh, we have a, a, a place down yeah, it's in the command comments. center. That's right, command downstairs center. Downstairs in the comments. Yeah. It sounds very intense, but I promise it's not. So if you have any questions or if you need to get registered, anything like that, we can help you out downstairs in the comments. Yeah, and the great thing about Prosper the City is that this is great for people who are what you know online, wherever you are, even if you're not a part of St. Louis, you can prosper your own city wherever you are. We strongly encourage you to, to this is a simple way to not only get connected, but to make a difference. So please. That's right, that's right. And then also our middle school retreat is coming up. That's October 8th through the 10th for 6th graders through ninth graders. Yep. Registration for that, though, is due this Wednesday, the 29th. So get your kids signed up for that. We have a bunch of different care groups that are kicking off. One of them is Cancer Companions. That's starting again soon. You can check our website for more information about that and all of those or pass that word along to someone who might need it. Um, and then we want to invite you back next week. We're going to look at a guy named Jacob. And uh, Jacob is, is a very significant figure in the Bible. If you don't know him, you're going to learn why. Um, but he's a guy who also has a, a pretty interesting story. Make sure you come back next week for that. Um, as you get ready to go, I want to speak a blessing over you. And I just want this blessing to be a reminder to you that no matter how you've been treated, that there is a God who is kind. His kindness, it never fails. And so um, whatever you've experienced, the harshness of the world, the cruelty of the world, just take a moment and receive the kindness of God for you. Keep your eyes fixed there. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Not a part in peace and serve, serve the, the Lord. Lord. Thanks for joining us today and being part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find a lot of helpful links and resources in the description below, or you can go to our website at pathfinderstl.org. Um, while you're there, we have a message podcast you can check out so that you can listen to our messages wherever you are and when you're on the go. Finally, don't forget to like this video, share it with friends, and leave a comment so that we know that you're joining us. Have a great week.